Good morning, and let's get started. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to talk about the CAN Spam Act. Um, in, in particular, to some questions that you might get. So, so CAN Spam. Just so you guys know, and again, for those of you that are live, uh, feel free to type in the chat because I do have my chat box up. Okay, and I'm going to make sure that I answer as many, or if not all, the questions that you might have there. So. Can spam has to do with um, marketing emails, okay? Now the question that you're probably going to get is one of the main rules in regards to can spam. There are, there are several of them, but the one that they usually steer you towards is that can spam must have a commercial address attached to every email, okay? So every email that you send, if you actually look through your, your spam box and like all the marketing emails that you get, <clears throat> there is a physical address at the bottom of every single um, email that you'll get. So every single email is going to have that, you know, a physical address that you need to, um, that you need to have on everything. So that's really going to be the can spam question that you might get, okay? Now, there's a couple of others, and I'm going to go through them as we're uh, kind of moving through the material. So what I want to do is this. I'm going to leave the canned spam information up there, okay? And keep in mind, too, this is going to be recorded, um, so this will be available for you guys. Uh, so don't worry if you miss something or if you don't get it right away because I have this on recording. So the first thing that I want to do, and I want to interact with you guys a little bit, too, so I want to know what your guys' thoughts are. Um, what you think the answers to some of these questions are, and we'll erase my smiley face for right now. So, the New Jersey Real Estate Commission, okay? So what is the New Jersey Real Estate Commission? What is their responsibility? What do they do? Uh, let me know, what, what do you guys think they do? Because we're going over New Jersey specific material today. So, New Jersey Real Estate Commission, what is their job? What is their role? So the real estate commission, they set rules and regulations. They said that that's a great, that, well, so here's what I'm going to say. They set rules and regulations for what? Actually, they, they more so, I, let me, let me rephrase that. They enforce. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to go with enforce. Thank you. Cause that's really, um, because they're not going to set any rules, regulations, laws. Um, it's early in the morning, so I'm going with what you guys are saying, but they're really enforcing them. They're not setting any laws. This is for, um, so here's the thing. They're going to enforce for a licensee, for licensees in New Jersey. Okay. Now here's what they are. They're a division of, they are a branch of the New Jersey Department of Banking and Insurance. Okay. New Jersey Department of Banking and Insurance. They'll usually abbreviate. So at New Jersey Real Estate Commission, don't be shocked if you see it abbreviated NJREC. Understand that that is the New Jersey Real Estate Commission. The test writers love abbreviating. They want to know, hey, if you saw this in real life, which in real life, you would probably be seeing it as NJDOBI, NJREC, okay? And they enforce rules and regs for real estate licensees, and I'm gonna say real estate licensees, in New Jersey. So who needs to be licensed in New Jersey? So who needs to be licensed in New Jersey? Someone said a broker, agents, brokers. So here's the thing, it's anyone who is accepting valuable consideration for their participation in a real estate transaction. Okay, now when I say their participation in a real estate transaction, Katie said I was close. Yeah, so anyone that earns a commission, <laughs> I'll say this, there's a couple of exceptions and I always talk about this. Um, for sale by owners. So someone's selling their own home. Do they need to have a real estate license? No, no, everyone gets that right. Everyone always gets that right. 
What about if I were to help someone? Let's say my neighbor comes to me and says, hey, can you put this on the Mulia Trulia Zulia for me? Like, I don't know how to work that. I don't know how to work the interwebs. Do I need a real estate license for that in New Jersey? So Tiffany said, yes. Tiffany said, I, you do need a license for that. So if I go and help my neighbor for the, to put it onto the Mulia Trulia Zulia, you think I need a license? Aisha said, no. Uh, the answer is no, no, only if they give you compensation. Yeah, so only if, here's what I'm going to tell you, only if they're actually giving you some sort of valuable consideration. So anyone who is accepting valuable consideration for their participation in a real estate transaction, it, when they're aiding somebody, doing something like that, because there are other people who participate in a real estate transaction, but their participation has different rules, different governing licenses, okay? So, um, Katie asks a really good question. Can you define valuable consideration? Yes, it could be. So typically it's money, right? Typically it's money, it's a fee. However, could it be uh, a toaster oven? Yes, as long as it has a value of some sort, it doesn't have to be a lot. As long as it has value, you need to be licensed, okay? Any type of value. So, and that's where people get tripped up with like, hey, do I need to be a licensed? Is there a dollar amount to that value? Nope, 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 and nope. Valuable consideration, okay? Um, bottom line is, so if I help my neighbor, okay? And here's the thing, this is where people get really kind of tripped up. Like, Everyone always knows like that guy who knows all the internet stuff and all the, you know, everyone knows that the techie, nerdy, super like geeky guy. So imagine you're for sale by owner. Okay. And your friend just sold their home uh, by themselves. And you're like, Oh, Bob, could you, could you help me, you know, put my home on, on the internet, like do what you did for your home, but could you help me out? And they go, absolutely, I could definitely do that. And then all of a sudden they give them a bottle of wine for doing that. Th technically, that person needs to be licensed, okay? So technically that person needs to be licensed. So let's go and do this. I'm going to expand that a little bit so that you get the full vision there. There we go, now all the words are there. So in New Jersey, anyone who is accepting valuable consideration for their participation in a real estate transaction needs to be licensed. Now, I'm gonna erase the can spam, I'm gonna erase NJREC, and what we're going to do is we're gonna talk about the different types of licenses in the state of New Jersey. So we have a broker, and we have a salesperson. Now, I'm going to tell you a couple things about these licenses, okay? And we also have um, another designation and a little bit of a breakdown when it comes to uh, these two different types of licenses. And I'm going to go into them. You ready? So we're going to talk about the things that are the same for each one. So something that's the same for each one is you have to be 18 years of age. Okay. You have to be a legal resident of the United States. Okay, so not necessarily a citizen, but you have to be a legal resident. Okay, you must have high school diploma. Okay, or GED equivalent. Okay, you also have to have good moral character. So when I say good moral character, what I'm saying is this. Okay, I'm saying you need to be able to pass a background check. Okay. So you need to be able to pass a background check. And they do run that. And it's something that if you have questions about, hey, am I going to get licensed because I have this type of uh, you know, felony in my past? There are some things that you, know, you need to have a certain amount of time that has lapsed, but that is something that the Real Estate Commission is really the best ones to answer that if you have that question, if you're watching this. So you have to be 18 years of age, legal resident of the United States, high school diploma, or GED equivalent, good moral character. Now let's talk about the broker. You need to have three years full-time experience, okay? Unbroken, so straight three years, okay? 
you need to have 150 hours of classroom time. Okay. And that is broken down 90 hours general, 30 hours ethics, 30 hours office management. Okay. Now, you also have to pass a state exam for both of these. Okay. State exam. So that's what you guys are studying for. That's what you're hoping to pass, right? You know, you're hoping to pass that state exam. So now, three years full time, you have to have 150 hours of classroom time, salesperson only, okay? This is for, and I'll put both here so that you guys kind of understand what I'm talking about when I'm looking at both of these things and I'm kind of writing it on my whiteboard, okay? Sales, 75 hours classroom time. Okay. Now I'm going to ask you guys a question. Okay. Cause you guys are smarty pants. You ready? You think that if a broker, okay. If a broker needs three years full time as a, uh, whatchamacallit as a salesperson, why wouldn't they make the age 21? Tell me, why wouldn't they make the age 21? There's exceptions, absolutely. Bang, bang, boogie, woogie. There are exceptions. So, exception to broker experience. Okay, to broker experience, okay? Not all the other requirements. All the other requirements are the same. The um, the, the broker experience, uh, exception is going to be for veterans who are honorably discharged with a service connected wound or disability. So if you have a service connected wound or disability, you can come right back from fighting for our country and basically go through the salesperson requirements and also go through the broker requirements and boom, just get your broker's license. So now let me ask you this question. Okay. Why would someone want to be a broker? What is the benefit of being a broker in the state of New Jersey? Like, is there a benefit? Is there not? What do you guys think? Earn more money. <laughs> um, not necessarily more money. Um, it depends. I know salespersons that make way more than some brokers that I know. Um, so it's not necessarily. So some people think, and that's why I love that. That I love to ask the question because some people have that misnomer. They're like, "Oh, I'm gonna make more money." It's not like you know when you're a teacher and then you go for your master's or your doctorate in education you know, that they automatically pay you more money. No, it's not like that like at all. So here's a couple of benefits for being a broker. Why become a broker? Not a broker, a broker. <laughs> I become a broker. So you become a broker because you can own your own company, okay? So we could make, we could open up Stu's amazing, fantastic real estate company or you can manage a branch office, okay? So those are the two reasons that you would become a broker, okay? Okay, so you would want to either open up your own company or, own, or be able to manage an office at some point. And here's the thing, you do not need to do either of those things. You could just have a broker salesperson's license because you want to have a broker salesperson's license because you're like, hey, I just want to do it. I want to have that, oh, that option open to me at some point. And that's what a lot of people do. So now there's also two different things that I want to tell you about. There's a regular broker license, okay? And then, so there's a broker, then broker salesperson. So who can tell me the difference between the broker and the broker salesperson's license? 
So what's the difference between a broker and a broker salesperson? Someone said nothing. Okay. There definitely is a difference. There is a difference. There is, there's, there's, there's a, there is a key difference here. Okay. So broker, the license is the same. Yes, the license is the same. Okay. So a broker, okay, is this. The broker is going to be designated as responsible in charge broker uh, for the company. Okay. Now, so when I say broker's license, I'm saying, hey, they have designated themselves as being the broker of record, being the broker in charge. Okay. If you are a broker salesperson, designated as working under the supervision of a broker, okay? So I work as a broker salesperson. Why? Because I have a broker who, uh, you know, I report to. I have a broker that is responsible for all the shenanigans that I do, okay? It is the same license, same requirements, okay? So someone asked, and this is a great question, can I become a broker if something happens to the broker in charge? Define something happening, like they die? Like Kabuski, they plots? For anyone who speaks Yiddish, they die. <laughs> okay, we're killing off the broker. So let's talk about that. And it's a great question, actually. So temporary broker's license in New Jersey, okay? Because sometimes the broker plots us and the broker dies. Okay, so what happens when, <coughs> excuse me, when the broker dies, so there's two things that'll happen. Number one, typically real world scenario, there's at least one other broker in, char broker in the company, okay? I will tell you this, I, there are very few companies I know of in New Jersey that don't at least have one broker salesperson in the office. Typically, a broker salesperson will step up and say, okay, yeah, you know, we're, we're, this is what we're going to do. Okay. We're, we're going to take over. We got this. Okay. We're, we're in charge. We're running the show. Okay. Um, but let's say there was none. Let's just go through a scenario where there are no broker salespersons to step in. Okay. A salesperson can become a temporary broker in the situation that a broker slash broker of record, synonymous with one another. So if you see broker, broker of record, synonymous, okay, uh, dies, um, they must complete all requirements for a broker's license within one year, okay? So that means taking the course qualifying with experience and passing the state exam. That all must happen within one year. So if a broker dies, okay, and there are no other broker salespersons to step in, which again, highly unlikely, I would say super highly unlikely, okay? <coughs> but that is something that could happen. So did that answer the question, Bernadette, for you? As far as the temporary broker's license, just give me a thumbs up. Let me know if that did. Um, because I want to make sure that I'm answering all the questions that pop up in the chat as best as possible. Okay. So that is what happens when a broker dies. So, so you were saying I was more or less referring to a broker salesperson. Well, they would just become the broker of record then. So there's no, there's nothing more that you need to do. You just probably need to fill out some paperwork, you know? Um, so that's why typically in a real world scenario, the uh, the broker a salesperson would just become the broker would just be you know there would be one of them because here's the thing you can't have two brokers or broker of records you can't have that so it's either it's one broker or broker of record and every other broker that works in that company is a broker salesperson so if the broker dies then a broker salesperson just has to fill out some paperwork yes. but if there was a scenario where there was no 
broker salesperson. Then what happens is a salesperson could become a temporary broker in the situation that broker dies under these circumstances, as long as they get their, uh, all their requirements fulfilled within one year. Okay. So hope that helps out in regards to that. Let's talk a little bit about the licenses. Um, so Katie said, let's say the broker dies and the office is his home. Uh, that th there were things that would need to happen because you're, you're making a really, a really good point. And like, that's like a far out there example. Um, but not too far out there. Um, it, it would have to in some manner, shape or form change location. Um, because if, uh, a broker passes away and his residence was being used as the office, there's, uh, in, and you're asking, is there a time frame? No. Um, again, there's, I mean, as far as I know, this is something, this is a scenario that I would have to defer to the real estate commission. You will never, you will never get asked this on the test ever because there's no set rule that yes, you have to do that. The only set rules are, Hey, a salesperson can become a temporary broker, uh, as long as they complete the requirements within one year. Okay. And the scenario you're giving me again is a convoluted practice question in regards to what is the practicality of this. And there would be legal aspects that, you know, uh, would jump into the realm of attorneys. So that's a really, it's a good question. And I like that. But sometimes here's what I'm going to tell you too, especially <laughs> if you're studying and you're feeling overwhelmed, something that I'm going to tell you is you don't need to have the in-depth, crazy knowledge of certain things, you know? There's, there is not a necessity to know, like that scenario is a cool scenario for me. I love hearing things like that um, and trying to figure out, okay, what would happen? But as far as what do you need to know for the test, that is not a test question that would ever be asked because there isn't a law regulation or rule that I could point to that would give you a definitive, uh, definitive answer. And she said, that is helpful for me because I feel like I need to know everything. Yeah, and there's that kind of like feeling with anyone who's studying for the test. So I mean, look, listen up, guys. And this is something that I want everyone to hear. You do not need to know everything. You do need, here's the thing. You need the Cliff Notes version of most things, okay? You need the Cliff Notes version of most things. And I actually refer to it as the coffee-worthy definition. So let me tell you kind of like my tip or trick, kind of like what I always remember is this. I picture this. When I'm doing flashcards or vocab, all I need is the basic definition of something that if my best friend were sitting down having coffee with me and said, Stu, I just started taking the real estate uh, class. I'm getting my license. I would like to know from you, um, what is joint tenancy? And then I would just give them a quick one to two sentence. Hey, this is what you need to remember for joint tenancy. Because here's the thing. If you go too much into the woods with that, your best friend's going to say to you, that's confusing. Okay. If you kind of just blurt out a couple of like talking points, like you say to them, oh, uh, joint tenancy, uh, T-tip. That doesn't make sense. So if you could get one to two nice sentences in and have a coffee worthy definition, um, you're going to be much better off than anything else. So keep that in mind when you're going through the material. So let's keep going with, and I hope that helped you out too. I'm going to erase all the stuff here and let's keep going and talk about, I want to ask you guys this. When do the licenses in New Jersey expire? When do the licenses in New Jersey expire? Okay. Every July? every other July? Yeah. June 30th of every odd year. Now, there's something that we need there. We need to have, we need to have continuing education. How much continuing education do we need every two years? 12 hours. Yeah. Two of them need to be in ethics. Okay. Two of them need to be in ethics. So guess what? 
Oh, Tiffany said by April 30th. You actually don't need to have it by April 30th. If it's later than April 30th, they just charge you a $200 penalty for not completing by April 30th. Okay? So here's what I'm going to tell you as well. Okay? So for any of you guys, so we're, we're recording this in 2020. So next year, 2021 will be a renewal year, okay? And every license will expire in on June 30th of that year. Every license, every license, every license, every license, every license, every license, okay? Now, if you do not get your license after January, uh, after January 1st, so if you get your license after January 1st, you do not need to complete any uh, any uh, continuing education. But before that, like if you get your license now, we pass, oh my God, celebrate. And um, also you have to do continuing education. So I will see you guys next year. <laughs> so uh, for those of you who said, hey, we wish we would have met you sooner. Guess what? Every two years you could get a little dose of me and you could uh, take continuing education classes with me. So that is the continuing education portion of it. Now, let me ask you this. And again, we're sticking with New Jersey stuff because I want to get as much New Jersey specific funness as we can into today. So what is the most the NJREC could charge penalize for an offense? And we're talking about like breaking rules and regs of the New Jersey Real Estate Commission. So what is the minimum? What is the maximum? So someone said 50,000. Boom. So minimum is actually, so here's what I'm going to tell you, because not a lot of people know the minimum. Not a lot of people know the minimum. Katie knows the minimum though. Minimum is 250, max is 50,000. Max is 50,000. So that is, and here's the thing. What I just told you right there, as of 2020, that information is accurate, okay? If you are listening to anything older than probably like four or five years old, also, if you have an instructor that told you otherwise, differently than that, they are incorrect, okay? They have not educated themselves. They have not updated their stuff. I am sorry for that. Um, however, uh, those laws changed um fairly recently so if they are not quoting you with the 250 minimum 50,000 maximum okay then they are wrong i am right <laughs> there is there is no middle ground on that one i am sorry about that but there are some instructors because here's the thing it used to be different they used to have a graduated scale um in new jersey um it, there used to be a graduated scale in new jersey that was different where there was like a 5,000 for a first offense, stuff like that. And a lot of teachers still teach to that because they don't realize well, they don't read the book every year. I read it three times a year. So what happens is this, um, a lot of the instructors still work off of the old graduated scale. And the reason why the real estate commission did this to change it is because sometimes that first offense that someone would do was so egregious that like the, the 5,000, um, what's we called? Um, the $5,000 uh, was just not in, in proportion to what the violation was. So Renee said, I thought if you got your license in the previous year, 2020, you do not need uh, to do renewal and continuing education. Listen to what I'm gonna tell you. Every license expires. If you got your license and you pass your test on June 29th, of 21, 2021, okay, you would have to renew it. It would expire the next day. You would have to renew it. So every license expires. Um, and it's not the year before. So if your instructor gave you that information, that is also incorrect. It is the prior six months um, that you would be uh, exempt from. So if you got your license within that six month window, okay, so January to June, okay, you're fine. 
But if you get it earlier than that, you have to complete the continuing education as well. And it's easy in New Jersey because they do allow online continuing education. So um, I, I don't see any issues with, uh, with getting it. Like it's really, um, it, it's, uh, it, that is the information. And here's the thing, a lot of instructors, and I'm not going to even fault the instructors on this one, because the information that's out there is convoluted and I've even had to correct myself. So just so you know that. Now, let's continue moving on talking about New Jersey Real Estate Commission. Like we haven't talked about them at all in regards to what their members are. So how many members make up the New Jersey Real Estate Commission? Okay. So I have several people putting eight and then one person putting 12. Um, so uh, <laughs> Katie, who just put originally 12, now says, no, I think eight is right. <laughs> so eight members. <laughs> Mob rule. When you see everyone write eight, you go, oh, man, maybe, maybe that's the number. <laughs> so there are five members who are brokers for 10 plus years. Okay, two members from the general public. Okay, and when I say general public, I mean like people who are accountants, not in the real estate field, like people that are just in different fields. Okay, so what happens is these serve for three year terms. Okay, so those seats serve for three year terms. And then there's one last one, which is the government seat, one which is the government See, now who chooses the real estate commission? Who chooses the members of the real estate commission? The governor, the governor selects every single one of them. Um, great, you guys are awesome on that one. Because a lot of people say, oh, realtors choose it or real estate professionals. Now let me ask you this, just out of curiosity, what's the difference between a realtor versus real estate agent? What's the difference between a realtor versus a real estate agent? NJAR, the New Jersey Association of Realtors. Gotta love the organization. So realtor versus real estate agent. So what happens is this, a realtor is someone who belongs to the trade organization, the National Association of Realtors. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you. Um, the National Association of Realtors, the New Jersey Association of Realtors, and of course your local boards, what they do is they lobby their trade organization. So they lobby for us. They also make sure that we're abiding by the code of ethics that they set forth because they set forth a code of ethics that we're supposed to follow, that we're supposed to say, hey, okay, we're going to do these things. And here's the thing, the code of ethics is typically superior to, to the laws. You know, it's, it, it's typically something that it's a higher set of standards that they hold us to. So something could be lawful and, uh, but, but still be unethical. Let me give you an example. We've changed it recently in New Jersey. So this no longer applies, but I'm going to give you an example that was fairly recent. Okay. So that you understand the difference between ethics and legality. Okay. Because there's a little difference. So according to state law, as of maybe like three years ago, it was perfectly legal to discriminate against someone who uh, suffered from gender dysphoria or was transgender or had uh, gender identity um, uh, concerns. They were uh, totally, you could discriminate against them in housing, all that stuff. The New Jersey law against discrimination did not cover them as a protected class. However, the National Association of Realtors said that it was unethical to discriminate against anyone suffering from gender dysphoria, gender identity that was transgender, things of that nature. So what happened was this, you had a situation where perfectly legal to do it. However, you could be brought up against ethics charges with the National Association and your New Jersey Association and local boards. Okay. And if found in violation, they could do everything from revoke your membership. So they can't do anything with your license. Okay. So if you don't, if you do something that is unethical, you might not be able to call yourself a realtor anymore and belong to any of the associations, the MLS, things like that. 
However, um, and they could impose fines, things like that, because you agree to those when you become a member of that association. These are all, and here's the thing, being a realtor is voluntary. Always understand that, that it is totally voluntary. It might hinder your ability to do some business in certain areas and it might not be practical for you. It might not be the best decision for your business. However, you don't have to be a member of the trade organization. So let's keep going on because I also wanna talk about um, the guarantee fund. This is a New Jersey thing. So let's talk about the guarantee fund. So as I erase, make some space for my guarantee fund thing. What is the guarantee fund? Fund. What is this? We make a one-time payment into it. Sure, I like that. So brokers and salespersons make one-time payment into it. Um, okay. And so does it protect the public? Mm, uh, that's see, this is, this is, uh, this is where, um, I, I'm going to kind of correct that thinking. Okay. Because here's the thing, the guarantee fund. Okay. Doesn't protect the public, the real estate commission and the rules and regulations that they enforce are set up to, okay. Uh, are set up to protect the public, but the guarantee fund does not do this, okay? And here's the thing, they're going to basically, so let me put down the, the amounts too. So $10 as a salesperson, okay? $20 as a broker, okay? You pay into the guarantee fund, okay? And what this is, it's going to reimburse members of the general public who suffered a monetary loss due to the negligence of a real estate professional agent, okay? So that, that's basically what it is. So reimburse members of the general public who suffered a monetary loss due to the negligence of a real estate agent, plum thump. So yeah, so Bernadette said, provides funding for schemes done to customers' clients. Sure, it could be a scheme. It, it could be something that was just negligent, right? Just simply negligent. Okay. Um, and what, what is the most that would be paid out of the guarantee fund? What is the most is that would be paid out of the guarantee fund? Most paid out of guarantee funds. Oh, it's going to be 20,000. Not 300,000. Nope, nope, nope. And then what happens is the licensee at fault will have their license revoked until paid back with interest okay that is it boom 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 okay that is it and here's what i'm going to tell you guys too and i want to make sure that this is super duper clear okay as of the time of recording this okay this is 100% accurate information, okay? Double check, triple check, all that kind of jazz. So if you have an instructor who has told you otherwise, they are wrong and I can take it to the bank because this material I have vetted, checked, and before I say it to you, I quadruple check it, okay? With three resources that I cross-reference New Jersey specific. So that's why, again, I, I don't, I hate to be the person to say, hey, I am the best in the world. But what I will tell you is this, the information that I am giving you, if, if you have been taught by any instructor and it is contradictory to this, they are wrong, period. End of story, smiley face. <laughs> so that is the information there. And I hope you guys, if you have questions on that, let me know, okay? But if not, we're going to keep going. So let's talk about this, okay? Let's talk about this. How long do we have to keep paperwork in the state of New Jersey? How long do we have to keep paperwork in the state of New Jersey? Okay, how long, 
How long? Mm -hmm. Some people are saying six years. Okay, okay. Some people are saying otherwise. Hmm. Let's say this. Unaccepted offers. <laughs> Some people are saying, wait, it depends. Ready? Unaccepted offers, six months. Okay? You have to keep them for six months. Everything else, okay, sales contracts, listings, everything else, six years. I refer to it as the rule of six, okay? So I refer to it as the rule of six, six months for unaccepted offers, sales contracts, listings, everything else, six years, okay? Um, so that is the scenario there. Now, something that's very important with the files, because a lot of people are going to electronic file keeping, and that's fine. All files must be available for the NJREC to inspect at all times. So basically, the problem that happens with this, and I'm gonna to talk to you about a little bit of a practical thing that happens, okay, is this. The real estate commission says you need to keep all those things, but what happens is everyone's an independent contractor for the most part, and what usually happens is a lot of people are doing stuff where they're keeping files and things in their car, at their home office, at their, you know, whatever the case may be. It all needs to be available for inspection at the main or branch offices. If the real estate commission were to physically go to them and say, hi, we need to inspect your files. That is, so in the olden days, there used to just be filing cabinets and basements and the boxes, okay? So Kevin wrote a good thing. Um, so Tiffany said, I failed the question on the test due to not remembering what NJREC stood for. No, that's why I use, and here's the thing, that's why I use in my, um, in, in my, in my writing here, NJREC, 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 because what happens is they're going to abbreviate it. The test writers are going to abbreviate it. Um, why? They're lazy. <laughs> and also, there is no document where the NJREC actually writes out their full name. So what happens is they abbreviate, and also they abbreviate NJDOBI, okay? Um, so you have to just get familiar with, and that's why when I teach, I usually use the vernacular and the wording that they would use on the contract. So a couple other questions came in Bernadette asked, do you know why they chose six years? No clue. Um, so uh, now someone else asked, Kevin asked, uh, are we going to have electronic or a hard copy? They don't care about how it is kept um, because most companies now are doing electronic paperwork, okay? So they don't care about that. There hasn't been any rules or regulations saying that they cannot do electronic filing. Um, but what I will tell you is as long as they are, um, you know, available to be inspected, then they're going to be fine. Okay. As long as they're available to be inspected, the real estate commission is going to have absolutely no issues and or concerns with that. So that being said, okay. Let's talk about something else because I actually put up on the screen somewhere else. I'm going to share my screen, um, my other screen, because I want to show you something that is important. So hopefully you guys can see this. Give me a thumbs up if you can, um, because I am going to show you something that you will get asked questions on. Okay. What can, keyword, can an unlicensed assistant do? What can a unlicensed assistant do. So let me show you this. They can answer calls, forward calls, process listings for submission to the MLS. They can place signs on properties, pick up keys and deliver documents. They can schedule appointments, set up files on track and secure documents, keep records of money, banking and deposits, 
follow up on loan ap applications and commute compute commission checks. They could do a whole lot of clerical mishmash, okay? There are things that they cannot do. Things that they cannot do. What can they not do, okay? An unlicensed assistant cannot show a property. Answer any questions about the listing. Any questions, any questions. Let me tell you real life scenario that got bubbled up to me okay as a broker manager and I, I i was flabbergasted but at the same token my assistant did the right thing um a client called real life scenario client called up from a house sign okay and an unlicensed assistant answered it there were no agents available to take the call Okay, they were all out on appointments or all busy. It was like something that was like, I think it was like actually like a Memorial Day where people were like driving through the Jersey Shore towns and everyone was just kind of tied up. Okay, so she answered the phone and the person said, Hi, I am colorblind. I just drove by this house and I am by myself. I don't have anyone else with me. Can you tell me the color of the house? Palm to forehead. She had to say, no, I couldn't, I can direct your call to, uh, you know, to another, uh, to, to another uh, person. So Kevin said, that sounds like a tester. I will tell you right now, the real estate commission isn't doing stuff like that, especially on like uh, a, um, a holiday weekend. They are not, they are, they're understaffed right now. It's a shame. Uh, but they're understaffed right now. Um, so they're not doing stuff like that. Um, and what I'll tell you is this client got really, really upset because they were like, this is a really simple question, but the real estate commission's rules and regs state that they cannot answer that question. Okay. They could not discuss or explain a contract without anyone uh, outside of the brokerage. Because here's the thing, there's a lot of times where um, I might say to my assistant, hey, could you, uh, you know, look at this, could you type in this person's name? Could you do this? Could you do that? Clerical work is fine, okay? They also cannot make phone calls for rent collection, okay? That's a property management role and they cannot do that. That sounds like something they might be able to do. Not uh not going to happen. Not in my house. Okay. The next thing they can't do is they cannot attend an open house or promotional booth without <coughs> a licensed associate present. So a lot of times they actually have situations where they're out in a promotional booth, like, oh, it's Asbury Park Day and we rented out and, you know, we took out a table or something like that. Now with the situation we're in with lockdown, uh, there is no Howell Day, Asbury Park Day, Freehold Day, where people are out there doing promotional networking, things like that. However, if they were, or there's an open house or something like that, that would be a situation where they could not, they could not do that without the presence of a licensed associate. Now, I'm gonna switch back to my whiteboard because I love my whiteboard. It gives me a chance to be a little more fluid. So can everyone see my whiteboard now again? Give me a thumbs up in the chat if you can. Yes, thank you so much. So the next thing we have to talk about in New Jersey is the main office and branch offices. Okay, now the main office is main location and it's where the broker slash broker of record supervises okay so that is going to be the situation where that's where the broker of record sits okay any branch office okay any branch office must be supervised by a broker salesperson there is not they will ask you questions where they will say oh can they be supervised by a uh uh, for salespersons, no, has to be a broker salesperson. 
a broker salesperson is the only one that can supervise that. Also in the state of New Jersey, every location must have the broker slash broker of records full legal name, okay, and the title broker or broker of record, okay, prominently displayed on the door or front entrance, okay. So a question came in from Katie. She said, is, some, is this sometimes called something else, broker manager? Sure, so here's the thing, you ready? The way the real estate commission works is this, and you, this is what you will see, okay? You will see people put, so I will tell you good advertisement, bad advertisement. You could call yourself anything. You could have any title, okay? Like you could be president, vice president, CEO, CFO, I don't care. Broker manager, those are all titles, okay? Fantastic, yeah, wonderful, absolutely. But you are technically a broker salesperson, okay? So some people say broker manager. Um, that is not an approved license type from the real estate commission. They're either a broker or a broker salesperson, okay? So you will see some people, the, the average, the average, uh, yeah, so, so here's the thing, broker manager, they'll put broker manager there. Um, really, in some manner, shape, or form, if you wanted to be technical and if the Real Estate Commission wanted to crack down, it should say broker salesperson somewhere on there, you know, licensed broker, broker salesperson. Uh, because people just put titles on there, and what happens is it's not clear um, but it also has just become kind of quasi accepted that broker manager is fine. Um, again, it, it's if they wanted to nitpick, you know, there are rules and regulations out there if they wanted to nitpick. And also this gets into the weeds of, you know, I'll call them Katie questions for this one where, you know, it's like how, how in depth do you need to be for the real estate test? And that's where I'm going to kind of pull back and say, hey, don't need to know that kind of, um, they'll be called broker salesperson on the test. Yeah, because again, the Real Estate Commission only acknowledges um, broker and broker salesperson because there you can have a clear delineation as to, okay, is this person the one in charge of the entire company or is this the one that is going to be managing this office? Okay, and everyone is responsible there. So let me also talk about responsibilities because you will get questions on the test in regards to who is responsible for what, okay? You know, poo poo hits the fan. Who, who is the responsible party, okay? So when poo poo hits the fan, the responsible party is going to be this, okay? The responsible party is going to be the broker. It doesn't matter if they didn't know, okay? If you're supervising someone, okay, and you're taking responsibility for their actions, okay, the broker is going to be responsible. Now, depending on the situation, uh, would dictate the severity of what the fines and, and results would be. However, however, you also want to make sure that you're, you're, you realize that the broker is responsible, no matter what, like the broker is responsible, okay? Salesperson's responsible too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the broker manager to an extent as well, potentially, um, but it depends on, on the circumstances, okay? So, also, let's talk about the locations a little bit more, okay? They love asking this question. Can you have an office in a, <coughs> a broker salesperson or salesperson's uh, residence? Oh, man, you guys are writing in fast and furious on that one. I've woken you up. <laughs> no, 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 no. Can it be, oh, Katie with the right answer. Yes, so it can, the answer is, the short answer is no. It can be in the broker slash broker of records home, okay? 
So you could have that. You have to have separate entrances. Okay. You have to have separate entrances in the workspace and also the uh, living space have to be separate. Like they have to be completely separate. There has to be a separation of church and state. There are several brokers in the state of New Jersey that have a setup similar to this. Okay. Um, I've been to many of their offices. Um, you have to be able to see the uh, entrance from the street. Yes, that is a requirement of, and here's the thing too, that um, and the broker and the entrance must have the broker's information. Yeah, that still hasn't changed. That hasn't changed at all. And here's the thing. I want to tell you this, New Jersey, New Jersey, you must have in all advertisements, okay, in all advertisements, you must have your full legal name. Listen to me, your full legal name. Okay. So here's the thing. You ready for how my, how all my stuff must look? Stuart J. Jacobson. That is how I am licensed. I am licensed as Stuart J. Jacobson. Okay. So here's the thing. Um, you have to nicknames. Let's say my nickname was, and look, you know, for all intents and purposes, you know, this is one of my nicknames, Captain Awesome. Okay. So let's say I said to everyone and told all my clients, hey, you must refer to me as Captain Awesome. My advertisements could look as this, Stuart, Captain Awesome, Jay Jacobson. Okay. Also, if you have like a longer name, a more like traditional name, like I'll tell you this, I have one of my friends in Middlesex County. His name is, um, what should I call it? His name is Rajvish, okay? Everyone calls him Raj, Raji baby. <laughs> so what happens is he has to put Rajvish, quotations, Raj, okay? Um, so another thing too, you, you could have, uh, look, me, uh, like a little bit of practical knowledge, uh, don't put anything too crazy out there. Um, I know someone who goes by the name Honey Bunny. Um, look, that is your prerogative. Totally, you can do any nickname you want. Um, if that was my agent, I would say, hey, you know, you're over the age of 70. Maybe that's not the name you want to go by. But hey, you know, whatever floats their boat. <laughs> so I figured to give you a little humor in the middle of the day, right? So you have to have your full legal name. Also, another thing about advertisement, brokerage name must be included and must be larger. Uh, here's what I'll tell you for the test, okay? For the test, it must be larger. Can you touch on a web page? Now there are a couple of web page. Uh, so here's the thing, with all the information that I am giving you, it should all translate over to a web page as well, a personal web page, things of that nature, okay? Do they have to make note that the office is at the broker's home anywhere on the advertisement? That is a great question. No, they do not need to make note of, hey, I also live here. Nope, 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 nope. Um, like I said, I've been in several different uh, offices for brokers that have a legal residence. Um, and I, I actually worked for one. It was the beautiful house, beautiful residence. And nope, didn't have to do that. Okay. Because as long as they are separate, they are separate. Okay, so in the eyes of the general public, as long as there is a separate entrance, there is a separate way to get in, and it doesn't, you are not walking into someone's living room, perfectly fine. Okay, totally cool. Okay, um, so great question. So going back to the web page though, because I know that there's a lot of, there's a lot of internet questions that have been popping up on the test that I have not been able to wrap my head around in regards to what they are asking, what's going on um, and stuff like that. So I will tell you this, every single thing for print advertisement should translate over onto the, uh, the, the, whatchamacallit, the, the web advertisement. So if we say the brokerage name must be included and it must be larger, that is the truth. It must be included, must be larger. If there is a question that leads you down the path of, does it have to be obvious? I would say yes, because here's the thing, the, the, what, what the real estate commission is trying to do. So understand, because I think it's important to understand the logic on this one. So this would be a perfect time to go down a Katie rabbit hole because I think that it will help you answer questions. So perk your ears up, listen to what I'm about to tell you. Okay, go down a Katie rabbit hole. You ready? 
the real estate commission, the reason they put, they say the broker's full name has to be on there, okay? The, um, the real estate broker's full name has to be on there, okay? The reason they say that the brokerage name must be included in all of this is because they want the general public to know and understand who is the responsible party if poo poo hits the fan, okay? Because a lot of times these individuals, these groups um, are operating <coughs> in a way that they're like a quasi brokerage, like a brokerage within a brokerage. And what happens is if stuff goes wrong or they wanna complain, it needs to be very clear as to who you complain to, okay? Who is responsible for this? That is the answer to everything. The real estate, uh, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> Tiffany, that was hysterical. Um, but Bernadette wrote, the question is this, Stu, does every real estate broker business have to state agency in the advertisement? No, because there are some, there are some, uh, there are some uh, brokerages that aren't referred to uh, as uh, agencies, right? And so it's, you don't have to put agency in there, okay? Because there are some that are not called, uh, like I used to work for uh, Redfin, okay? Um, I used to work for Redfin.com. There's nowhere in the advertisements to say Redfin.com agency. Like it, not, okay? Um, something else we have to talk about in the state of New Jersey. Like we got, like, it's amazing how much stuff we could actually talk about. So this was advertisements. This was office locations that we went into. I want to talk a little bit about the consumer information statement. Does this apply for a pocket card? So, <clears throat> what I what I will tell you is this: um, the pocket card rules and regs are that you should be carrying. So you could go to the Real Estate Commission's website and print out a pocket card. Okay, you should have um, on you at all times a uh, your license number, your pocket card, your printout from the Real Estate Commission's website okay, when you're doing business, okay. Um, it used to actually be a pocket card that they would send you. Um, now it's a printout that you would get from the Real Estate Commission's website, but you should keep that on your persons. I keep that in my glove box um, because wherever I'm driving, uh, it's not that they got cheap on us. And I'll tell you why, because now <coughs> the licenses are transferred uh, electronically. So there is no real paper trail anymore. Um, so since they went to a uh, electronic system where you literally click a button. So what used to happen with the licenses is they used to be hung and framed in the main office of every company. Okay. So actually, if you want to talk about craziness, like a little bit down the rabbit hole, uh, Weikert has thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of agents across the company. Okay what would happen is this. They had a room in headquarters that was just licenses on a wall because they needed that legally to comply. So Natalie wrote in the question that does the name of the broker have to be on the card as well? The name of the brokerage would be, okay? So like if you worked for Weikert, that would be. Uh, and uh, it, it, so here's the thing actually on the way that the bro the uh, pocket card is going to be, uh, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, on there, it's the font is not going to matter because this isn't an advertisement. So your pocket card is simply an identifier, not a advertisement. Um, but on any advertisement, you cannot have the brokerage name smaller than the uh, than than your name. Okay, and your name has to be legal. So what is the consumer information statement, guys? What is this? Katie said, I'm not clear on what a pocket card is. So pocket card is this. Um, we used to get uh, an identifier that would have your name and your license number. Now, if you go to the Real Estate Commission's website, so if you type into Google, NJ Real Estate Licensee uh, Search, okay, then what would happen is you would be able to type in your last name. Like I'd be able to type in Stuart Jacobson, find me, 
click on my license and I could print that out as identification that I am a licensed real estate professional. Okay. Um, and so, and usually, like I said, um, your teacher was big. So Natalie, your teacher was big on the consumer information statement. Yeah, this is a biggie. This is a biggie because this is something that gets people in trouble or lack thereof gets them in trouble. So, uh, oh, the pocket card. Yeah. The pocket card used to be huge, but not really anymore um, because people are just printing it out. And also you could literally go on the site and search everything, every single uh, licensee. However, let's get into the consumer information uh, statement. So this is an informative statement. Duh, consumer information statement, right? Okay. This is an informative statement that outlines the ways in which we can and how we intend to work with the potential client in the state of New Jersey. Okay. So there are four ways in which we could work with people in the state of New Jersey, buyer slash tenant agent. Okay. Seller slash landlord agent. Then we have dual disclosed agent. And we have a transaction broker. So Kevin said, this has to be presented to buyers or sellers at the earliest possible time. Yes, absolutely. Because here's why it tells them. Um, so KDS is my answer, right? And you said defines types of agents. So yes, it does. It, it, so it does. It's two parts. It's two parts. Okay. It does outline the ways in which we can work with them, which would be your answer, right? And how we intend to work with the potential client, okay? So if your intent is that you're gonna be a transaction broker, that's why you need to disclose it to them. You need to say, here's an informative statement on how I can work with you and how I intend to work with you, okay? And I'm gonna go into each one, kind of touch on each little one and how they pertain to New Jersey some are going to be very simple. Some are going to be more convoluted. Okay. But all of these are legal ways in which you could work with an age, uh, a client in the state of New Jersey. Okay. So here is the situation. Buyer agent, tenant agent, landlord agent, seller agent. You owe the fiduciary responsibilities. Okay. You owe the fiduciary responsibilities. Okay. To both of these, okay, to both of these, to whoever it is, a buyer, tenant, seller, landlord, okay, and that is your client. Now, understand this in the state of New Jersey, okay, the broker of record or the broker is identified as the agent. In agency relationships, they are identified as the agent. The client or the principal is whoever you're working with. You are simply a representative of, so you're like a little sub arm. So this is the salesperson, okay? Okay, they are a little sub agent of the agent slash broker. And that will help us, once we identify that and we understand that, and we'll put client here, okay? So, in a buyer, tenant, seller, landlord agent, the fiduciary responsibility from the agent to the client is with whoever that is, okay? It's very simple. And any third party, so if you represent the buyer as the client, okay, the seller would be the customer. The customer, you only owe them fair and honest dealing, okay? You do not owe them disclosure. You do not owe them anything unless you are legally obligated to do so, okay? In a dual disclosed agency, this is where people get tripped up. They get confused all the time. So here's the simple one. You're working one transaction. You represent both the buyer and the seller. That is dual disclosed agency. Why do I call it disclosed? It must be disclosed and consented to. Everyone must agree. If you do not have consent, if you do not have disclosure, it is illegal. It is an illegal beagle, okay? 
So, and for those of you who just laughed because I said illegal beagle, that's what I call illegal things. They're illegal beagles. <laughs> so, um, dual disclosed agents um, are simply that of they must be dual disclosed. They must be disclosed. Okay. Um, and they represent, so like I said, they represent both the buyer and seller in a transaction. Or let's say I'm going to pick on Katie a little bit. Me and Katie work for the same broker, broker Bob. Okay. Katie has a listing. Okay. I have a buyer. We are now technically dual disclosed agents. If my buyer goes, oh my gosh, I really like Katie's listing. Okay. Then me and Katie would both be dual disclosed agents. Why? Because the broker has the relationship with both the seller and the buyer. Does that make sense? Give me a thumbs up, guys, if that makes sense to you. Okay. Or if you have any questions. Yeah. So what happens is before we have any kind of substantial conversation, so Lisa wrote, is the fiduciary relationship still to the seller, correct? Um, then Bernadette wrote, can the broker salesperson represent both the buyer and the seller? So here's the thing. Once we enter into dual disclosed agency, what a lot of people don't understand, and this is something that I do want to point out, it actually says it in the consumer information statement. Hence, why it is important to understand this. Once you become a dual disclosed agent, you cannot advocate or help them in any manner, shape, or form. Any of the parties. You are simply a conduit. You become a robot. You have no thoughts. You have no anythings. You have no nothing. You have no input. You cannot guide either of them. You just simply must say, here is the offer. Would you like to accept or deny? And if they say, what should we do? I don't know. I am dual disclosed agent. I cannot do any of that for you. Done. Literally. And here's the thing. That's why it's important that they read the freaking consumer information statement because it actually says it right in there in plain black and white. So guess what? Go into your book, read the dual disclosed agent part. Okay. And then see how it's worded. And then you're going to go, Holy sweet baby Jesus. It's totally clear, black and white. Agent becomes robot. It literally like, I, short of basically saying that, it says that. Um, and that's where a lot of people, so a lot of times in the situation where me and Katie have our own clients, the temptation is there to go because we still have our own corners of the world that we go back to. The temptation is to advise each party as if you were working as a buyer's agent or a seller's agent. And you, um, you cannot do that. Again, you must be robot, okay? Bernadette says, um, Kevin actually put in the chat, uh, uh, yep, it's basically that. that. That is basically robot section. So if you read that, you're still gonna sit there and say, Stu is right. Dual, dis dual, dual agency can be scary because you really don't know if they can be trusted. Here's the thing. A real estate agent who is professional can work a dual agency situation um, in, in a really fair way. Um, however, there are people who, don't, who, one, don't understand it, okay? Two, um, uh, don't, uh, don't understand how to properly manage it. And three, work in a way that is kind of underhanded. And here's the thing, I know buyer's agents and seller's agents who do that. Now, the last one that we have in the state of New Jersey is a transaction broker. Transaction broker. So transaction broker owes no fiduciary duties to anyone. This is typically, typically a, um, a business decision where someone might say, hey, I'll put you on the MLS for X amount of money, okay? <coughs> but I won't give you any kind of representation. I won't give you any kind of anything, all right? So that is a transaction broker, okay? That is what a transaction broker will do, okay? So Lisa, you wrote in referral. What is, what, what do you mean referral? Uh, give me more substance than that as far as a question. I'd be more than happy to answer it, okay? So that's a consumer information statement. Hey, I'm gonna talk about other things in the state. Uh, so, 
Not necessarily a referral agent uh, as far as a transaction broker. The transaction broker could be a full-fledged agent. They simply don't owe fiduciary responsibilities to anyone in the transaction. They are a part of the transaction, but they are not, they do not owe anything there. So it wouldn't be a referral agent because a referral agent would not have anything to do with the transaction. They're literally referring it. Okay. And they have nothing to do with it other than collect money at the end. Okay. So let's keep moving. Let's keep grooving. Okay. The next thing I want to talk about is what we need to disclose as far as material facts in the state of New Jersey and what we don't need to disclose as material facts in the state of New Jersey. Okay. Boop. Missed that little spot. Okay. Stigmas. Psychological. Effects on a house. Okay. What do I mean by that? Murder, suicide, death, any of those things. Uh, 15 people murdered in the basement, murder house, okay? In the state of New Jersey, paranormal, yeah, if there's that would be a psychological effect on the house, okay? Um, Bernadette said they do not need to be disclosed, okay? You do not need to disclose these things. This is a big no. Now, here's what happens. I go to different offices and I teach continuing education and I tell them, you do not need to disclose stigmas or psychological effects on the house. And then they say to me, Stu, our broker says you need to disclose them. Listen to what I'm going to tell you, boys and girls of the good church. Okay. If someone tells me, Stu, broker, that there is a ghost in the basement. His name is Larry, okay? And he sings me a song every day at 3 p.m. I'm going to look at them and I'm going to go, cool, it's my business practice that I disclose that to the buyers, okay? Uh, then they'll say, legally, do you have to disclose that? And I'll say to them, no. But my business practice is that I disclose that to all of the buyers because I do not want to have someone be sued and have like this big loophole where they say, Stu, you didn't tell us about Larry, okay? Um, so that is the situation there. So let's talk about like my favorite story in the entire world, okay? The elevator shaft, the elevator shaft story, okay? Uh, yes, the elevator shaft story, okay? I, have, I retell this one and I think that it's absolutely fantastic um, because it really is a good one and it's a true story, uh, a tragic story, um, but I do want to talk about it and I think that it's really great. So there was a home in, uh, and here's what I will tell you. If you're hearing this story and you're saying, I know these people, or I know this story, or I know it well, and there's something you're missing, something you're not, uh, take it with a grain of salt, okay? Because I try not to divulge all of the dirty, dirty little details of it because I really just want to get to the bottom of it. I could actually make something up, but this was a true story, so I actually like it a lot better, okay? So there was an elevator in a home. So in residential homes, okay, yes. <laughs> Tiffany just said he's going there, Katie. Get ready. This is a Katie rabbit hole. So um, the elevator shaft story. There's an elevator in a uh, shaft in residential homes, okay, what happens is this, how they work is they don't look like the elevators that you're used to looking like, okay? So they, you won't see the two steel silver doors open up, a whole bunch of buttons in there. They look more like a closet door, okay? And there's an elevator shaft that works the same as commercial elevators, but what happens is when you're on the level that the elevator is not on, it locks, okay? You cannot get into it for safety reasons, okay? Um, now there was a home that had an elevator shaft and there was a housekeeper who was working in the house and their younger daughters, uh, I think they were like six and nine were playing around the house and tragically died in the elevator shaft because of either the switch being off or it malfunctioning. Don't know. Don't know. They died. Okay. Fast forward. 
homeowners remove the elevator shaft, okay? Remove the elevator shaft and then they go to sell it, okay? They go to sell the home. People buy the home, okay? Neighbors come over and bring over bunt cake, lemon bunt cake. That's what I'm going to go with, with icing on it, because I love that. Lemon bunt cake with icing. And <laughs> that's for you, Katie. <laughs> so um, they then say to them this, you ready? They say to the buyers, oh my gosh, I cannot believe you bought this home knowing about what happened. And the buyers go, what happened? And they told them and the buyers sued the seller, realtors, um, like everyone. They sued the pants off them. Okay. Now, let me ask you, knowing everything that you know, okay, you have enough information here to actually probably answer this to the best of your ability. Did the new buyers win their lawsuit? Yes or no? Type it in the chat box. Let me know. No, no, no. Yes. I have an I don't know. Yeah, you guys are going to you guys are going to like this one, okay? Uh, this is everyone who answered no, don't give yourself a gold star. Um, it is yes. The buyers won, okay? And here's the thing, not because <laughs> Katie said I abstained, I know the answer. Yes, you do. So stigma psychological effects on the house. Um are going to be a no as far as having to disclose them. But material facts and latent defects, okay, material facts, okay, and latent defects, you do need to disclose. So they won on the basis of the fact that um, the, uh, whatchamacallit, the, the fact that the uh, home uh, had an elevator shaft in it before that might have malfunctioned, might not have, not sure, not, not, not entirely, you know, certain, but they removed the elevator. So that was a material fact. Okay. There could have been, here's the thing. Um, what should have been disclosed is, Hey, we removed an elevator here that was here before. Okay. Um, so that during the inspection, they could inspect and say, okay, we'd like to know more about this. You know, hey, how was this done? Stuff like that, blah, 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 okay? Nick said, that's a tricky one, but that makes sense. Yeah, it is a super tricky one. Um, and it does make a super amount of sense. Um, so um, what is a latent defect that caused a tragedy so it should have been disclosed? Yeah, that is, you said that is a latent defect that caused, that caused a tragedy. So it's not the death that had to be disclosed right? The death is how, see, so the death was a paper trail. It was the breadcrumbs that led us to know like, okay, everyone knew about this. Okay. Um, and they could prove it through articles, news clippings, stuff like that. Everyone knew there was an elevator there. Okay. Um, but they didn't disclose that. So that's the situation there. Now I want to talk about a couple of other things before we wrap up. Okay. And also, if you do have any other questions, something that I might not have touched on, let me know. Because I told you guys, I'm going to keep this to about an hour and a half. And I think for the state-specific one, this is actually a really good kind of amount of time, maybe a little longer than that. So can I give examples of a latent defect? Yeah. So a latent defect is going to be anything that is not uh, apparent with the naked eye. So here's an example that I like to give um, is this one. My parents have a leak in their shower, okay, on the second story. It causes like every three months for 20 years straight, there has been a water spot on the ceiling, okay, that just comes. And they have had, I think, 30 different contractors come in and try to inspect and try to tell them where the leak is coming from. No one can tell them. And so every several months, they just patch repaint, have another inspector, uh, have another contractor come in, do some sort of work, and that's it. Now, what happens is this. Let's say they decide in between to sell the home, and they never tell the new buyer, hey, we're having this mystery leak, okay? Um, and then all of a sudden, the buyers see the leak on the ceiling, because it appears it's like the, it's the timing of that leak, 
And then what they do is they call in a contractor. And again, my parents have called in 30 contractors. And the contractor goes, oh, yeah, I was here two months ago. I don't know what the heck's going on. <laughs> so my parents were being deep poo poo. Uh, so someone said, yeah, this happened to me when I purchased my home. It's, it's common. You know, it happens. Look, I found out in my home, like my prior, the prior owners to my home did everything half behind. Okay. So they literally, if they could do something for $3 that would probably cost 15 to 20, they would do it. They were just, they were super, I, I, it's amazing how cheap they were. And now I'm going for the Cadillac of everything. So in, in 30 years, my house is going to be wonderful. Okay. However, I, I wanted to talk about one other thing in New Jersey, Megan's law, Megan's law. What is Megan's law? It is. And why do I draw a smiley face there? Because this is a fantastic law that has been really, I will tell you this. It has been a law that protects uh, people within a community to have knowledge of registered sex offenders. Buyers, okay, can not have information regarding registered sex offenders given to them by a licensee. You can not disclose this information. No, even if you know, I don't care. You cannot do that. The only two resources that you can give them is the state police website and uh, local police stations. That's it. Because here's what happens, and you have to understand this, and, and I'm going to go into this in a little bit, is um, it, this... Yeah, I know this is on the test, hence why. Um, so Tiffany said, can you, uh, can you give it to them? Can you give them what, Tina, can you give them what? So Tiffany, this is definitely uh, on the site, on the test. Kim, this is on the test. That's why I wanted to go over this, okay? Megan's Law is 100% on your state portion, okay? You can give the website, right? You can give them the state police website, uh, local police. You could do all that. That you could provide them with, okay? And they can go and they won't get much information. They'll get some, okay? Um, but what happens is this. The reason why buyers are not allowed to have unfiltered access to that information is that sex offenders are typically transient. And what that means is they typically come and go, okay? So what will happen is this. You'll have a situation where um, buyers are going to uh, then, if they had unfiltered webs, unfiltered information where they could get all the information, because again, they can't get all of it. Um, that would detrimentally that would be detrimental to the people living in the community where there's a, the presence of a registered sex offender. Okay, so you can only give them the website that they could go on, which is state police or your local police office, uh, your local police station, okay? So with that being said, um, I want to wrap up, okay? And ask you guys if there are any other questions that you may or may not have, okay? So, and I'm gonna stop my recording here, okay? Adverse possession. So here's what I'll tell you. I'll go over adverse possession, Kevin, okay? Um, and can you suggest a good study technique? And do you have chapters in the book that have more weight? Um, it depends on what book you use. So there's, those are a bunch of questions. So, so the uh, math questions. So a couple things. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you right off the bat, I have on my YouTube channel, um, if you look in my private lessons, I have an entire private lesson that I did with someone all on math. Okay, so you could go into the private lessons playlist and uh, go there. So Lisa said the Dearborn book. Dearborn, I this whole um, this whole webinar is based off of chapters one through three. Okay, um, that is your New Jersey section. If I had to give you one, um, the most important chapters I would say are one through four. Then after that, probably five through about fifteen. Okay. And that, that, that's the ones that like, here's the thing. If you could get down and actually be able to lecture on like one through 15, you could pass the test. I mean, that's, that's, that's more than 70% of that. Um, so someone said, can you please clarify if we get licensed tomorrow, do we need continuing education by next year? Yes. 
Um, so Bernadette wrote in, I am a prep agent member and I use the study apps. Uh, and I'll tell you this, if you guys aren't a prep agent member, um, yeah, get on that because here's what I'm going to tell you. I love, so you guys know I'm a member. I'm a, I teach for prep agent. Okay. Um, and I'll tell you this, I'm going to put it in the chat. Um, if you aren't a member, uh, sign up for it. Okay. I put it in the chat and, uh, I'll, I'll tell you that. Um, do you su suggest getting through the PSI test? No. Um, some people say it's great. Um, no, I, I don't, I, I, there's nothing I've really gotten from that. Some people really like it. Uh, I don't recommend the PSI practice test, um, at all. Uh, so that's my situation there. Okay. So what I was going to say is this. I am going to stop the recording now, but I will still stay on. So this is where we're going to go up to.